ejection of many of the Puritans from the Church of England in 1662 was not the end of the story for Puritanism, for Reformed theology or for the gospel in the established church. This lecture looks at a common tendentious reading of church history and by examining the lives and teaching of three significant Anglicans in the later Stuart period, Bishop Edward Reynolds, William Gurnall and Dr Thomas Horton, it shows that this results in a skewed perception of the evidence, leading to an underappreciation of the ministries of such people and a false understanding of the ecclesiastical challenges of those times. When Charles II came to the throne and restored the British monarchy in 1660, it ushered in a period of dramatic religious change. Some historians speak of the post-restoration eclipse or overthrow of Calvinism. J.I. Packer says that after the restoration, Calvinism had the status only of an oddity maintained by non-conformists. It's true that the Great Ejection of 1662 was a tragedy, yet scholars are increasingly coming to see the idea that it was the death of reformed divinity in the national church as a misrepresentation. As Stephen Hampton has convincingly demonstrated, after the Great Ejection in 1662, the reformed may not have been in the majority, but they remained nonetheless an extremely significant group within the Church of England. That church had, after all, decided to continue holding to the clearly Protestant and Reformed Statement of Faith in the 39 Articles. Conscious of standing within a much wider European Reformed tradition, those who held to Reformed distinctives under and after Charles II were also keen to demonstrate that they were the heirs of a respectable, homegrown branch of that international movement. They kept the flame of Reformed theology burning even before the evangelical revivals of the 18th century gave that theological tradition a significant boost. Many post-Restoration Reformed Anglicans epitomised what Hampton calls reformed divinity but with restoration curlicues. That is, some of them were content to hold to reformed theology without rejecting all the ornamental twists associated with aspects of the neo-Laudian agenda. They sometimes had a devotion to episcopacy as if it was absolutely necessary for the church of the church's essay, not merely its bene essay, as it's said. They wanted to actively suppress nonconformity, some of them, and they were rather fond of high church stage props like robes, candles, elaborate church architecture and furnishings. This makes some of the reformed Anglicanism of this period a peculiar and eccentric phenomenon at times, within the wider intellectual movement, but still recognisably reformed in terms of its soteriology and other major doctrinal commitments. Though not every reformed Anglican was like that, some of them were also thoroughgoing evangelicals before that name became associated with the revivals of the 18th century. Too often, when writing about the evangelical revival, historians have ignored the vibrancy of the conforming reformed tradition as it continued to exist in the latter half of the 17th century. J.C. Ryle, for instance, informed his readers that before the evangelical revival, everything in the Church of England was natural theology, and cold moral essays in the pulpit, and sermons were, he said, 
utterly devoid of anything likely to awaken, convert or save souls, with nothing of the weighty Reformation doctrines for which our martyred reformers had gone to the stake. G. R. Belaine, in his enduringly influential yet tendentious history of the evangelical party in the church, calls this the glacial epoch in our church history. Only the cautious and the colourless remained with a dreary drab coloured faith, devoid of power or beauty. But is this characterization of the late Stuart and early Georgian church really fair? Is it correct to say, as David Bebbington does, that the doctrine of justification by faith had well nigh disappeared and that there is scant evidence of a link between the reformed tradition of the 17th century and the evangelicals of the 18th century. Stephen Hampton's revisionist account of this period has led to a reassessment. He identifies at least 12 bishops, six deans and several senior divinity professors with decidedly reformed credentials in this period, not to mention several of the greatest scientific minds, one of the most celebrated preachers, two eminent patristic scholars and some influential ecclesiastical courtiers. Even more recently, Jake Griesel claims that even Hampton has significantly underestimated the strength and numbers of conforming reformed divines between the Restoration and the Evangelical Revivals between 1660 and 1730. Regarding the reformed accounts of election and justification at this time, no less a Calvinist than John Owen could claim in 1674 that it was maintained by the most learned of the dignified clergy at this day. Owen thought that most leading Anglicans were sound on justification by faith alone, and he used that fact to defend himself and others from those who attacked dissenters from the act of uniformity. The people that Owen was speaking about, and those like them in the National Church, worked hard to fortify a reformed reading of the 39 Articles and the Prayer Book, especially on justification, the Trinity and predestination. And in convocation, their national gathering, they fiercely resisted the latitudinarian liberalism of bishops like Gilbert Burnett, who sought to legitimise Arminianism with his studiously ambiguous readings of the 39 Articles. After the ejection of most of the Puritans from the Church of England in 1662, there arose various theological problems within the dissenting community. They themselves were divided into various competing groups. A stress on the Bible alone to the exclusion and denigration of systematic and historical theology led to a great many Presbyterian, Congregational and Baptist churches being fatally infected with Socinianism or Unitarianism in the century after the Great Ejection. As Michael Watts says in his classic study of the dissenters in this period, their Neo-Arminianism predisposed them to look more favourably than their Calvinist brethren on liberal trends in theology. This liberal tendency was due in no small part to greatly weakened ministerial subscription to Articles of Faith, which was sometimes resolutely non-existent. Many dissenting non-conformist ministers and churches associated confessions of faith, even basic ones committing them to Orthodox Trinitarianism, 
to be anathema. They were too closely associated with those persecuting Anglicans who imposed their articles and prayer book on the established church. And it did not fit their nuda scriptura hermeneutic. A drift towards Arianism or Socinianism was evident within the Church of England in this period to some extent as well. However, because subscription to the standards or formularies of the faith was legally compulsory for clergy, the Church of England tended to resist Unitarianism more easily. Trinitarian faith was front and centre in Article 1 of the 39 Articles, for example. It was preached in the homilies or official sermons of the church and it was baked into every service in the Book of Common Prayer. As Catherine Lacuna has rightly affirmed, the liturgy far more than theology kept alive in Christian consciousness the Trinitarian structure of Christian faith. The Church of England may have excluded many Puritans and been taken over by a more Arminianizing sort of crowd who held some of the levers of power, but it was not completely lost and certainly not at the official level because it retained its reformed soteriology as well as Trinitarianism. As Philip Dixon says, the sheer rhythm of the liturgy familiarised churchgoers with belief in the Trinity. And the same must surely be said of the constant repetition of, to take another example, reformed ideas in the collects or brief weekly prayers too, not to mention the doctrine inculcated by the prayer book communion service. Indeed, many within the bounds of the National Church retained a great sympathy for the Reformed theology of its Reformed confession and liturgy, which would later prove to be a force for the Church's renewal and revival. But that is what it was, a revival in the 18th century, not the imposition of an outside influence on the Church, but the reinvigoration of a tradition that was very much alive. Now, to illustrate this thesis, we will look in this lecture at three exemplars of post-Reformation, post-Restoration Reformed Anglicanism. We will meet Edward Reynolds, a Westminster divine who was elevated to the Episcopacy in the Restoration Church. We will encounter William Gurnall, a Puritan parish minister who was not ejected in 1662. And we'll also look at the career of Dr Thomas Horton, a leading Puritan divine ejected in 1662, who later conformed and led the largest reformed Anglican church in the city of London. Finally, we will briefly touch on the polemical work of John Edwards, a man with impeccable Puritan heritage who joined the Restoration Church of England and tenaciously defended and promoted its reformed credentials, providing leading evangelicals of later generations, such as George Whitfield and Augustus Toplady, with the intellectual and theological arguments to sustain their membership of the established church as thoroughgoing Calvinists. My hope is that by re-familiarising ourselves with the ministries of these people, we will improve our understanding of the church in this period and increase our appreciation for those who publicly held the reformed constitutional line during a difficult period when they were in many ways out of favour. Edward Reynolds was born in Southampton on the south coast of England in 
and educated at Merton College, Oxford, where he was noted for his skill in Greek. In 1622, he was appointed preacher at Lincoln's Inn before becoming a minister in Northamptonshire. His moderation was noted, particularly in a sermon touching the peace and edification of the church, in which he made a distinction between fundamental doctrines and things indifferent, urging that in cases of heresy, idolatry and tyranny, we must of course contend for the faith, but that in other matters people should, he said, be willing to silence and smother our private judgments, to relinquish our particular liberties and interests, to question and mistrust our singular conceits and fancies, than to be in any such thing stiff and peremptory against the quiet of God's church. He noted that there were in fact many factions within Roman Catholicism and so he urged Protestants to let such a spirit of peace and meekness show itself in our lives, our doctrines, our writings, that they may never have advantage with the same breath to speak both truly and reproachfully against us. Humility was vital for maintaining the unity of the spirit and peace may in this case be preserved by moderating the fervour of our zeal against those that are otherwise minded. And so he concluded on this, lastly, so long as there is sound agreement in fundamental truths and in the simplicity of the gospel, we ought rather to deny our wits and to silence our disputes in matters merely notional and curious, which have no necessary influence into faith and godly living, than by spending our precious hours in such impertinent contentions, for gain of a small truth to shipwreck a great deal of love, and that while we perplex and minds of men, the minds with men, with abstruse and thorny questions, we take off their thoughts from more necessary and spiritual employments. Reynolds was, moreover, a man of such firm reformed convictions that he was invited to preach before the House of Commons in 1642 and to become a member of the Westminster Assembly in 1643. He signed the Solemn League and Covenant, a treaty for the preservation of the reformed religion in 1644. He had a hand in the composition of the Westminster Standards. In 1648, he was made Dean of Christchurch, Oxford and Vice Chancellor of the University until a change in precarious political circumstances saw him replaced by the rising star of independency, John Owen. During the 1650s, he preached again to Parliament several times. After the death of Oliver Cromwell, he increasingly preached for peace, moderation and an accommodation with Charles Stuart and the Episcopalians who were gathering around him. As the restoration of the monarchy drew near, he was made a royal chaplain and pushed for a moderate settlement which would be acceptable both to Presbyterians and Episcopalians. In autumn 1660, he was made Bishop of Norwich by the King as part of an overture to reconcilers such as him in the hope of restoring peace to the church. Some people questioned whether his acceptance of this position was down to his allegedly covetous and political wife, Mary, but Ian Atherton is surely right to assert that Reynolds' decision, however, was in keeping with his character, his moves towards reconciliation in 1659-60, his advocacy of reduced episcopacy 
in the Worcester House Declaration and his long-standing call for unity within the church and conformity to its discipline and worship. As a bishop, Reynolds attempted to put into practice the reduced reformed model of episcopacy which had been outlined by Archbishop Usher and which he himself had advocated, even ordaining some dissenters to enable them to minister within the Church of England. Reynolds made an enduring contribution to the renewed edition of the Book of Common Prayer in 1662. It included his Prayer of General Thanksgiving. Reynolds was a prolific author, so we can note in his many books what his major doctrinal commitments were. Now, it would, of course, be beyond the scope of a brief lecture such as this to demonstrate Reynolds's reformed convictions on every subject, but it should be sufficient to do so from a sampling of his work on some key theological issues. For example, the continuance of the doctrine of justification, sola fide, by grace, by faith alone, in this period, has been questioned by some, as we have seen. According to Reynolds, we are declared righteous by God because of the imputation of the active and passive righteousness of Christ to us by faith, which unites us to Christ only by grace and favour. He says, nay, though we could fulfil the whole law perfectly, yet from the guilt of sins formerly contracted, we could no other way be justified than by laying hold by faith on the satisfaction and sufferings of Christ. When it came to understanding more about those sufferings of Christ, he advocated and defended the doctrine of penal substitutionary atonement. The need for justification arises because of humanity's sin, on which subject Reynolds held to the reformed doctrine of total depravity. He wrote that all men and every part of man is shut up under the guilt and power of this sin. So is their sin in every faculty of man. He writes that first in a wicked man who is totally in the state of sin, there is a total and absolute impossibility and impotency to do anything that is good. Reynolds also affirms the sinfulness of concupiscence along with the 39 articles, article 9, which states that concupiscence and lust, lust hath of itself the nature of sin. This must be affirmed, he says, against what he calls are new Pelagians. These people, expressly contrary to the doctrine of St Paul and the Articles of the Church of England, with the harmony of other Reformed churches, deny the sinfulness of original concupiscence, or that it always lusteth after the Spirit, sorry, against the Spirit. What he terms a brood of sinful men hold this opinion, noting that in the margin uh, works by Lombard, Bonaventure, Durand, Aquinas and Bellamine. He's concerned throughout to counter those who in his own day too are reviling the doctrine of the reformed divines on this doctrine. He particularly laid into the remonstrant theologian Simon Episcopius, who had led the Arminian party at the Synod of Dort, in 1618 to 19. Reynolds writes of Episcopius and his wicked words about the ability of natural man. He says, absurd is the doctrine of the Socinians and some others that unregenerate men by a mere natural perception without any divine superinfused light the, uh, these are the words of Episcopius, and they are wicked words, 
may understand the whole law, even all things requisite unto faith and godliness. Now, Thomas Aquinas in the Middle Ages had taught that original sin was not purely a privation, a taking away, but also a certain corrupt habit in us. But Arminius disagreed, saying that the absence of original righteousness only is original sin itself. According to the Confessio Remonstrantium of 1621, which Episcopius had drafted, it is proper or actual sins which obscure our mind concerning spiritual matters. They blind us and finally deprave our will more and more by the habit of sinning. It is not original sin which does this. On the reformed side of that debate, the canons of Dort, therefore, asserted that mankind suffered privation in the fall, which itself also produced in us horrible darkness, vanity and perverseness of judgment, as well as impure affections. They say all men are conceived in sin. They are born children of wrath, incapable of any saving good, prone to evil, dead in sin and servants of sin. A generation, generation later, Reynolds was firmly on the side of the reformed here, writing of universal corruption, which hath in it two great evils. First, a general defect of all righteousness and holiness in which we were at first created. And secondly, an inheritant deordination, pravity, evil disposition, disease, propension, to all mischief, antipathy and aversation, aversion from all good. So Bishop Edward Reynolds then was a clearly Calvinist conformist, keen to be seen as in harmony with other reformed divines. William Gurnall was born in 1616, the same year as the great John Owen, and was educated in Cambridge at that bastion of Puritanism, Emmanuel College, for seven years. He became rector of Lavenham in Suffolk from at least 1644 until he died, through a period when Presbyterians were in the ascendancy, then the Congregationalists, and then a restoration of the Church of England. He was a well-known Puritan throughout all of this in a part of the country which was steadfastly committed to Reformation theology and practice. In fact, some of the brightest and best Puritan ministers lived within 20 miles of him, including John Owen and several members of the Westminster Assembly. In 1656, Gurnall preached a sermon at Stowmarket in Suffolk before the election of Parliament men for the same county. We can observe something of his underlying political and religious commitments from this sermon. No sins lie heavier on God's stomach and make him more heartsick, he said, than theirs who stand in high and public place of rule and government. He spoke against Anabaptists who despise magistracy and order, and he confessed that at present, tis a blustering time, England is now in travail and calls you to her labour. Take heed that the ghost of your ruined nation doth not haunt you to your graves for denying your help, despite some unhappy disappointment in former assemblies. Get out and vote. Your country needs you, in other words. It did not matter, he claimed, what kind of government a people live under as what kind of governors. So whether England was a republic or a monarchy, it required godly members of parliament. Since most people in attendance 
had undertaken the solemn league and covenant to reform both church and state, consider, he said, the solemn obligation that lies upon us by a national covenant, covenant famous throughout the Christian world, and we infamous for the breach of it, to promote and procure with our utmost endeavours the reformation of the land. God hath, I believe, most of your hands to show for this, and darest thou, who hast bound thyself in such a covenant, give thy voice for an unworthy man to sit in Parliament? Gurnall stood against popery and sects such as the Anabaptists, the Seekers and the Quakers, because these errors are forerunners of popery, he said. But at such a turbulent time, what England needed was men of healing spirits, so that if you can find any that have more compassion towards this divided nation than others, especially whose bowels work more tenderly over God's people in the land and their unbrotherly contentions, who are for expedience, how to compromise those differences. Those are the men fit for such a time as this. Ministers and magistrates must work together to find a way forward. Indeed, they are the two legs on which a church and state stand. He that would saw off the one cannot mean well to the other. An anti-ministerial spirit is an anti-magistratical spirit. The pulpit guards the throne. Now, all this helps to make sense of the fact that in 1662, Gurnall decided not to leave the Church of England or be ejected from it. He was ordained presbyter by Bishop Edward Reynolds two days before the Great Ejection in August 1662, an act which would have required him to renounce the Solemn League and Covenant and declare his allegiance to King Charles. Now, for doing this, Gurnall was lambasted by some, including the author of a scurrilous tract with a scathing title. It was called Covenant Renouncers desperate apostates. Neither is Mr Gurnall alone in these horrible defilements, hateful to the soul of God and his saints, it claimed, but he is compassed about with a great cloud of witnesses, even in the county where he himself liveth, as well as elsewhere, men of the same order of anti-Christian priesthood and brethren in the same iniquity with himself. As J.C. Ryle wrote in his brief 19th century biography of Gurnall, whatever opinions we may hold about Gurnall's conformity, we must all allow that the course he took was not likely to make him a favourite with either of the two great religious parties into which England at the time was divided. He was a Puritan in doctrine, and yet he steadfastly adhered to the Church of England. He was a minister of the Church of England, and yet a thorough Puritan, both in preaching and practice. In fact, he was just the man to be disliked and slighted by both sides. Ryle says that he even checked Gurnall's handwriting on the subscription document to assure himself that Gurnall really did sign it in 1662. Perhaps because both of them shared a Puritan background, Gurnall felt he could trust Bishop Reynolds and vice versa, and was happy to be episcopally ordained by him and stay in his diocese of Norwich. Perhaps Reynolds even asked him to stay so that his diocese was not emptied of good reformed and evangelical clergy after 1662, or even perhaps he allowed him a degree of latitude in applying the new requirements of conformity, turning a blind eye 
perhaps, to Gurnall's Puritan scruples about certain things in the liturgy. All this cannot have been easy because even Gurnall's father-in-law, another Puritan, seceded and left the Church of England at this time. It must have been a relationally painful time. Gurnall died in 1679, leaving at least eight children. Three of those uh, married clergymen and another one was himself ordained. So Gurnall's legacy lived on in the Church of England for many decades. His funeral sermon was preached by the Bible commentator William Burkett from the nearby church of Dedham in Essex, which had a strong Puritan tradition. Gurnall is best remembered, however, for his magnum opus called The Christian in Complete Armour, published between 1655 and 1662, which is an extended look over three volumes at Ephesians 6 verses 10 to 20. One volume was dedicated to Lady Mary Vere, Baroness of Tilbury, a prominent Anglican patroness of the Puritans, who was strongly associated with the international Calvinist cause, and whose funeral sermon Gurnall would himself preach in 1672. In fact, that Gurnall was asked to preach on that occasion at the funeral of Mary Vere is a clear indication of his stature within the Reformed constituency. It's clear from the sermon that Gurnall associated most with the Reformed tradition, praising Archbishop Usher and John Dodd, for example. At the same time, he was very clear that the testimony on which the saints' faith relies is the infallible word of God, and we rejoice only in Christ Jesus as the sole entire object of our trust. The Christian in complete armour is not a work of polemical, but of practical divinity, of spiritual consolation and exhortation, as J.M. Blatchley puts it. Yet we can still observe something of Gurnall's doctrinal commitments within it, to confirm his reformed connections and credentials. For example, on the doctrine of sin, which we have previously examined with regard to Edward Reynolds, Gurnall too held to a reformed account. The state of unregeneracy is a state of impotency, he affirmed. The spirit finds sinners in as helpless a condition as unable to repent or believe on Christ for salvation as they were of themselves to purchase it. A person in a Christless, graceless state is naked and unarmed and so unfit to fight Christ's battles against sin and Satan. A soul out of Christ is naked and destitute of all armour to defend him against sin and Satan. The Christless state is a state of impotency. He even speaks of forlorn souls bound with the chains of their lusts and the irresistible decree of God for their damnation. This view he contrasted with the Arminian account of sin. He said, the faithful servants of Christ tell sinners from the word that man in his natural state is corrupt and rotten, that nothing of the old frame will serve and there must needs be all new. But in comes an Arminian and blows up the sinner's pride and tells him he is not so weak or wicked as the other represents him. If thou wilt, thou mayest repent and believe, or at least by exerting thy natural abilities, oblige God to super add what thou hast not. This is the workman that will best please proud man best. So he had a reformed view of sin, but also of election and the ordo salutis, and a particular burden to relate this to the doctrine of the saints' perseverance or preservation. God, having brought his counsel thus far towards its issue, 
surely will raise all the power he hath, rather than be disappointed of his glory within a few steps of home. I mean, his whole design in the sinner's believer's salvation, God loves his saints as the purchase of his son's blood. They cost him dear, and that which is so hardly got shall not be easily lost. He that was willing to expend his son's blood to gain them will not deny his power to keep them. Indeed, God can never forsake the Christian, he wrote. Oh, what admirable security hath the great God given his children in this particular. Now, this doctrine had become something of a hot topic around that time. The Armenian minister John Goodwin published a book on perseverance, which was ably answered by John Owen in The Doctrine of the Saints' Perseverance Explained and Confirmed, only the year before Gurnall published the first edition of The Christian in Complete Armour, 1655. And so Gurnall was not slow to take sides with the reformed. Let us see whether Satan be able to pluck the Christian away and step betwixt him and home, he said with some warmth. Away then with that doctrine, which saith one may be a saint today and none tomorrow. Now a Peter, anon a Judas. Oh, what unsavoury stuff is this. A principle it is that at once crosseth the main design of God in the gospel covenant, reflects sadly on the honour of Christ and wounds the saints' comfort to the heart. On what grounds did he oppose what he saw as the opposing Arminian scheme? First, he said, it is derogatory to God's design in the gospel covenant, which we find plainly to be this, that his children might be put into a state sure and safe from miscarrying at last, which by the first covenant man was not. Second, if the saints may finally fall, then it reflects sadly on Christ's honour, both as he is entrusted with the saints' salvation and also as he is interested in it. Now, how well do they consult with Christ's honour that say his sheep may die in a final ditch of final apostasy, notwithstanding all this. The life of his own glory is bound up in the eternal life of his saints. He reasons passionately that Christ and his members make one Christ. Now, is it possible a piece of Christ can be found at last burning in hell? Can Christ be a cripple Christ? Can this member drop off and that? This emotive language expressed a theological impossibility for Gurnall. Thirdly, he did not dash the generous wine of God's word with the water of man's conceits. No, he gave them pure gospel. Truly, this principle of saints falling from grace gives a sad dash to the sweet wine of the promises. The soul-reviving comfort that sparkles in them ariseth from the sure conveyance with which they are in Christ made over to believers to have and to hold forever. This, this is indeed wine that makes glad the heart of a saint. Though he may be whipped in the house when he sins, yet he shall not be turned out of doors. So to weak believers, Gurnall pleads, be of good cheer, good poor soul. Your eternal safety is provided for. When you hear Christ is turned out of heaven or himself to be willing to sell his inheritance there, then, poor Christian, fear thy coming thither and not till then. Saints must guard, however, against a careless security and presumptuous boldness, he said, but they need not, should not, doubt God's promises. Gurnall criticises those who bend and change in order to keep their preferments, saying 
the Christian must stand fixed to his principles and not change his habit, but freely show what countryman he is by his holy constancy in the truth. He did not maintain his pastorate in this apostatizing age by jettisoning the convictions about reformed truths that he had held throughout his preaching and writing career. There was no contortion of his basic principles, though as he confessed, these have been trying times as ever came to England. It has required more care and courage to keep sincerity than formerly. After 1662, Gurnall was far from the only one to find the most expeditious and compassionate course in the midst of the great contentions of the time to be one that worked with the new political establishment rather than against it, however uncomfortable that might make him personally. Like Gurnall, Dr Thomas Horton was educated at the staunchly Puritan Emmanuel College, Cambridge. He was appointed by the Civil War Parliament to ordain ministers in London and worked for the establishment of Presbyterian church government. In 1647, he was made president of Queen's College, Cambridge, and in 1651 was chosen as vice chancellor of the university at the same time as John Owen was taking on that role in the other place, in Oxford. When Charles II returned to the throne, Thomas Horton had to step down as president of Queen's College because his predecessor was still alive and under the terms of the 1660 Act, good royalists were allowed to have their old jobs back. Bishop Edward Reynolds's son also fell foul of this act, being ejected from his Oxford Fellowship, but was immediately able to take up another post in Worcester Cathedral. This is all part of the Restoration Settlement and Act of Oblivion, uh, setting aside the things that had happened during the Puritans' tenure in office over the past decade or so. Now, Arthur Barham, the staunchly Presbyterian minister of St Helen's Bishopsgate, did not conform in 1662. Samuel Lee and Peter Sterry, both also sometimes lecturers at St Helen's Bishopsgate in the city, were also forced to give up preaching. However, after a few years into Regnum, in June 1666, Thomas Horton came back into the ministry and was appointed rector of St Helens. A few months later, the Great Fire of London swept through the city and destroyed almost all of the churches, including St Paul's Cathedral. But St Helens was miraculously unscathed. Horton, as rector of St Helens, was described by one of his former students as a pious and learned man, a hard student, that is, he studied hard a sound divine, a good textuary, very well skilled in the original languages, very well accomplished for the work of a minister, and very conscientious in the discharge of it. According to another observer, Dr Horton hath a very great congregation of half conformists, in whom he hath much interest. He is a man of very good learning and a constant laborious preacher, that is, he laboured hard, on his sermons. Richard Kidder, who sometimes officiated at St Helens after Horton died, reported that he found many of his communicants kneeled not at the sacrament, but were otherwise very devout and regular. This nonconformist practice had been indulged by their previous minister, Dr Horton. The communions were very great and great sums of money were given to the poor at those times, and considering the mischief of dismissing such a number of communicants and sending them to the nonconformists, Kidder said that he decided to continue to give the sacrament to those who refused to kneel, and he risked being suspended for it. So this was a large, wealthy church, 
with a history of half conformity. You may even say that it is still so today at St Helen's Bishop's Gate, but I couldn't possibly comment. Horton was a senior reformed figure with a history of training young preachers for the ministry in Cambridge and a reputation for sound teaching. Can we establish his reformed credentials from his sermons so as to add to the number of clearly reformed ministers working in the post-restoration Church of England? Yes, we can. And we're about to do so. Let us examine Horton's sermons on Romans chapter 8, published posthumously in 1674. Horton was very clearly opposed to the Arminian doctrine of predestination on the basis of foreseen faith. So on Romans chapter 8 verse 30 he preached against this doctrine of Pelagians which is opposite to this present truth and text which we have here before us where it is not said that whom he called he did predestinate, but whom he predestinated, then he called. A little later on the same verse, uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 30, he adds, Predestination is limited and confined to a certain number of persons. Therefore, we read in scripture of two sorts of vessels which are prepared of wrath and of mercy. And this serves to meet with the contrary opinion of some persons who teach that upon such and such conditions of faith and perseverance etc God does elect and make choice of all when as God yet knows that such and such person will never come up to those conditions as having purposed in himself not to bestow such conditions as these upon them. So he's clearly against the Arminian doctrine of predestination on the basis of foreseen faith. Secondly, we have here also the doctrine of final perseverance, that God's children, they cannot fall from grace or be excluded from the kingdom of heaven, he said. This point is very clear in this scripture in Romans. Horton's account of the atonement and justification is equally clear. Christ has satisfied the justice of the Father for all his elect people by dying for them. Moreover, he has imputed his righteousness to us and freed us from condemnation. So likewise, not only the active obedience of Christ's life, but the integrity of our nature in Christ's person being imputed to us who by faith are set unto him, covers our disobedience and the relics of corruption yet remaining in the best of us. And so being justified, we cannot therefore be condemned. Christ, he said, you see, paid the debt that we owed by enduring the penalty and doing what the law required us to do. Christ's suffering, he said, was of the whole anger and wrath of God, expressed in all particulars. There was no punishment for kind which we should have suffered, but the same was personally suffered by Christ, both in body and soul. He speaks of the eternity of our punishment, which Christ has answered. The punishment which was not only the injustice of Pilate or the malice of the Jews, but God's own heavy wrath and indignation. At the same time, he also holds to the reformed doctrine of irresistible grace. It is not in our own power to hinder our own conversion, neither, he says, where God is minded and purposed to effect it. Those who are predestinated, they are called. That is, they are efficaciously and infallibly and against all opposition. The grace of conversion it is such as cannot be resisted. On Romans chapter 8 verse 1, Horton taught that Christ hath offered and laid down a sufficient ransom and price 
for the redemption of all. But in Christ, it is in him. So those only who are elect and true believers have actual and efficacious redemption because those alone are in him. On Romans 8 verse 32, Horton wonders who the all are for whom Christ died. To say it means all people would make it too large, he says. It is sufficient for all, but as to particular application and special intention, so it respects only all believers. And so all the scripture still expresses it to us. He made his soul an offering for his seed. He shed his blood for his church. He laid down his life for his sheep. He saved his people from their sins. This verse must be understood in context. By this us, it plainly refers to such persons as he had before mentioned, whom he had foreknown and predestinated and called and justified and was for, which is not all men at large and in general, but only a set number of persons in particular. Christ died for the apostle, for the Romans, for eminent saints, and for weaker Christians all. This is a reformed doctrine of particular redemption. His reformed doctrine undergirded Horton's call to ministers to preach the gospel promiscuously to all. He didn't see limited atonement as limiting evangelism by no means. So, to conclude, 45 years after the Great Ejection, John Edwards of Cambridge, who has been styled a kind of J.I. Packer in his own day, wrote this. That which we now call Calvinism is to be found in the writings of the ancient fathers of the church and is the very doctrine which the first reformers of our own church professed and maintained and which is contained in our articles, homilies and liturgy, and which our archbishops and bishops and the whole body of our English clergy have generally asserted and vindicated. Now this John Edwards, the son of a leading London Puritan, thus testified to the enduring vitality of the conforming reformed tradition within the Church of England, many decades after the Restoration. He was far from a lone voice in this regard, even at the turn of the 18th century. As he testified himself, I am not left alone. I do not, like Athanasius, encounter the whole world, no, nor the whole clergy. In turn, Edwards's work would be picked up and cherished by the next generation of Calvinists within Anglicanism including the great evangelical revival preacher, George Whitfield. Edwards's work was on Whitfield's list of the most important volumes of divinity, alongside other classic reformed works by people like Matthew Henry, Thomas Boston, John Pearson, John Owen and John Bunyan. Edwards was one of the most influential shapers of English Calvinism according to Dewey Wallace, though few have ever heard of him, or those like Reynolds, Gurnall and Horton, on whose shoulders he stood. The picture that some people have, even some evangelicals, that after 1662 the Church of England was a wasteland for the gospel and for reformed theology, is very much at odds with the evidence that I have presented in this lecture. The good people did not all leave. The baton was handed on, with some difficulty perhaps, but nonetheless successfully after the restoration of the monarchy. 1662 was not the end. And I think showing this helps us better understand the Church of England in that period it was not entirely devoid of a gospel witness. It also gives us a clearer picture 
of what the 18th century revivals actually were, a revivification of a tradition that had been marginalised but not euthanised after the Cromwellian chaos. Traditions can be passed down and preserved even in the absence of big name celebrity endorsements, dramatic revivals and access to the great and the good at the centre of power. Lessons we would do well to remember in our own turbulent days. Mm -hmm.